Hello, I'll be talking to you today about um, a single wood, Lady Park Wood, which is situated on the boundary between England and Wales in the Lower Wye Valley. <clears throat> it's a national nature reserve, a site of special scientific interest, but long before it became either of these it was a, a, a site of considerable interest to science because it had been set aside at the tail end of the Second World War by the Forestry Commission as a place where ecologists could study the long-term development of natural woodland. It also has significance for yourselves as it um, harbours populations of both species of horseshoe bat um, but I know little about those, I'm afraid. My only real contact with bats, in fact, I'd hoped to learn rather more at this conference if it had been for real. Um, my only real contact is with um, our home population of lesser horseshoes, which inhabit our barns and outbuildings and occasionally have to be evicted from our living room. Lady Park is part of the spectacular limestone gorge which runs down from Simmers Yat towards Monmouth. Most of this is wooded and at least along the riverside most of the woodland is ancient and semi-natural. The main trees are listed on the right there. The interesting point about these is that we are in woodland which is certainly had beach in since the Middle Ages and which is part of the very western end of its European range. Small leaf lime and large leaf lime are both major components of the stand and large leaf lime of course is one of the rarer British native trees. And the other slightly unusual feature is that um, the main oak in the wood, even though it's limestone soil, is actually sessile oak. And most people were far more used to seeing that on the acid hillsides of, 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 of the Welsh valleys further west. Since the late Middle Ages, these woods were treated as coppice, and the main product was charcoal. If you'd gone there and before 1850, you would have found a very thin woodland comprising mainly small trees and coppice regrowth, a scatter of limes of charcoal hearths, and a small number of little huts like this, which were inhabited by the charcoal burners while they worked there. No doubt also there was an all-pervading smell of wood smoke. Lady Park Wood was last coppice for this purpose in 1870 and then simply allowed to grow up. It was thinned very lightly by the 20th century and nothing much happened until the Second World War when we were in dire need of timber which couldn't be imported and even woods which were recognised to be visually important um, were harvested of their timber simply to supply the essential needs. Lady Park Woods case fortunately um, those who did the felling recognised that this was a high highly valuable landscape and they didn't fell all the trees they left a kind of shelter wood here of beech trees and oak trees which is inherited by that part of the wood that was felled then it's only two-thirds of the wood the rest of it was um, left undisturbed during the second world war and this has now grown up um, almost untouched for 150 years So in the older part of the wood, we have stands which have been allowed to grow naturally for 150 years, really. Um, in 1870, they were coppice, and now they're something which I could claim to be natural woodland, large trees, irregular structure, great deal of dead wood, lying, leaning, and standing. This and the next slide briefly summarises how we've recorded the wood. 
Recording started in 1944 when bombs were still raining down on London and indeed on me since I was a small boy in London at the time. It was then that Eustace Jones of Oxford University um, agreed with the Forestry Commission that the wood would be indefinitely left unmanaged in order to study natural succession within woodland and in order to do so he laid out in the end nine transects running from top to bottom of the wood. I should explain that the map of the wood shows the Y on the right so you can see the smooth curve of the river and the high ground of course is to the left and you can get a sense of the topography from the little inset diagram top right. You can see also on that diagram that some of the ground is stippled and those are the stands which were not felled during the Second World War. The rest of the ground which is clear was felled. Now as a result of recording within these transects um, we have detailed information on 20,000 individual trees at regular intervals through 75 years. In 1984 we added a compartment to the southeast which is not shown on this map but the Forestry Commission would carry out um, thinning operations and hopefully regenerate it um, by natural means um, so that we intended to have a comparison between a managed stand and an unmanaged stand which is a useful attribute. Um, that has indeed happened but the Forestry Commission have never fenced their portion and the result is that it is grazed flat by deer and there is no regeneration at all. Here I'm showing you a small sample of the charts which have been the basis of all recording. These were prepared by Alan Orange in 1977 and they've proved to be spectacularly accurate and clear. The um, data on the chart shows the exact location of a tree, the species and its size and whether it was dead or alive in 19. 77. The inset photographs are perhaps a rather jokey way of, of demonstrating that we return again and again at irregular intervals to record the state of each of the trees and map any new ones which have appeared. In 1984 Jonathan Spencer and my wife Susan were photographed recording the size of a lime tree on transect 2 and in 2016, 32 years later, almost to the day, we reenacted this recording and we reenacted it as far as we could get in exactly the same clothing that we had used 32 years earlier. In fact, I have a suspicion that Susan's anorak is indeed the very same anorak that she had earlier, but maybe not, maybe. Of course, the tree has changed a little but only a little, the ivy died, um, bran little branches on the side grew, um, but the people have, well, only changed a little bit. The results from all this recording have been summarised in a book which we published three years ago. Um, you see there the front cover and to the left the, the chapter headings. It contains a great deal of detail and somewhat leavened by a very generous allowance of colour photographs which KB allowed us. But if you want to see any more detail about what Lady Park Wood is like, how it's changed and what we've made of it, this is the place to go to. It's not easy reading, I, I grant you, but it's the place to go. So what have we learned from this immense recording effort? A great deal, but for me, thing, three particular features stand out. The first is that the wood has become almost natural within a century, or perhaps a little longer. 
And I'm not just saying that because I can take photographs, which I can convince most audiences are of natural woodland. Certain measurable attributes which are listed there, which bring it within the range of those forests in continental Europe, which we call virgin forests. Secondly, the wood is constantly changing. If Eustace Jones, who started it all, could come back now, and he would find that three quarters of the trees which he recorded in 1945 are no longer there. They're dead and gone. Mostly those are the smaller trees, of course, but the canopy trees have also thinned out and now perhaps in a order of 45% of those he recorded in the canopy in 1945 are no longer there. <clears throat> the processes of change can be resolved into three different elements listed there. And it's important to recognize that they're different in quality. The growth and competition is highly predictable and I'll look into some details of that in a moment. This growth and competition is interrupted by events or disturbances of various kinds and these are entirely unpredictable. We simply have no idea what's going to hit the place next. And thirdly, the regeneration which takes the form of seedling growth or new growth from old stumps is a response to those two other processes. In other words, that too has an unpredictable element. Let's look at each of these processes in turn, starting with growth and competition, that is to say the predictable element in the system. And provided there isn't a disturbance in any given period, the big trees will always be growing faster than the smaller trees. Moreover, their mortality rates are lower. And the light demanding species within the mixture tend to die faster than shade bearing species. In other words, as time passes, these period follows another, the basal area is increasing until it and the timber volume reach a plateau about which it fluctuates around about 35 square meters per hectare. The stand increasingly consists of large trees and, um, and little else. Dominance does change from the pioneers to the shade bearers such as beech and lime in this particular wood and individual trees retain their relative positions I put there by which I mean it's very rare for one tree which gets above its neighbour to be overtaken again later by that neighbour growing past it. It's rather like the boat race if you get to the first bend under a head you will win the race in this case, the trees win their race to a position in the canopy. And all this is predictable and relentless and is carrying on all the time. The smooth processes of growth and competition are interrupted by various forms of disturbance or events. There's a lot to take in here, but broadly speaking, we have all the events which have impacted on Lady Park Wood in the last 75 years and the types of events which are many and various are listed down the left hand side. Some of these events are semi-natural in the sense that um, the people have been involved in their arrival. Elm disease is a classic example there. Um, which arrived in Bristol on a boat and um, has since spread to the reserve. Drought, of course, was an entirely natural event. So there are different qualities of event there. The main events have been the great drought of 1976, the slightly earlier arrival of elm disease, and now the arrival of ash disease, which looks like producing a disturbance on the scale of the two other great disturbances of the 1970s. 
One thing to notice about these disturbances is that several have arrived as an event, but they have continued as a called chronic condition. Elm disease immediately killed a lot of big elms, um, but it has now become a kind of chronic condition of the survivor, some, something that the survivors have to pick up, put up with. Drought too, rather surprisingly, has been the same. Not that we are always having droughts in the wood, rather that um, the effects of the 1976 drought have been long lasting. Trees which were very damaged in 1976 but lived on have, been conti have continued to die off. So trees are still in the wood there, dying from the 1976 drought. And the last thing I think it's worth noting is that the incidence of disturbances has increased with time and I'm sure that's real not an artifact of recording. It means that as the wood has become more natural it has become less stable. Uh, these two photographs will give you some sense of how the 1976 drought impacted the large beach. To the left is a tree which died in 1976 and was photographed in 1983, by which time quite a lot of branches had come off and a good deal of bark. It has since um, rotted at the base, fallen over, and I could now have difficulty finding exactly where it grew. Now another tree, the one on the right, which is of roughly the same size and quite nearby, almost died but recovered. And now if you approach it from the upper side, the far side, you will see a tree which looks healthy, has a full crown and seems to be growing vigorously. But if you approach it from this side, you will see that it was profoundly damaged, that it's actually extremely dangerous um, and may have no more than 10 or 12 percent of its cross-sectional area at the base as sound wood not a place to conduct discussions or start wondering about other things in the wood, of course. These events or disturbances create gaps, holes in the canopy. And to illustrate the kind of shapes and sizes of these things, um, I've chosen to show you the map we made in 1987 of the pattern of gaps created roughly 10 years after the Great Drought. Um, you'll probably appreciate that this is an underground map of the transects in the wood. The dotted line is not the Thames, but it is the line of the cliff. The upper half of the transects, um, which is above the cliff, um, most of these gaps were created by the drought. And you can see the irre irregular patterns which have been created. Um, in some places the canopy almost completely collapsed, in others it was scarcely touched and usually it was on the deeper soils where understandably the trees survived better. In the three transects below the cliff, seven, eight and nine, most of those gaps were created by two processes. One was elm disease which had not um, which had still left its mark on the wood at that point. And the other was the process by which trees on steep slopes constantly fall. They grow one-sided, are unstable, easily fall and crash down through the trees below, creating elongated gaps by a process which is akin to a tree avalanche. The outcome, of course, is that the woods take on a kind of patchy structure but gap formation is not the only thing which creates gaps. Um, one of the more curious results of washing Lady Park Wood has been to observe how one squirrel debarks Pole Stage Beach vigorously, whereas its neighbour in a different territory hardly bothers, creating another form of patchiness. These gaps, well here's some illustrations of them, um, just four photographs to show the sort of differences of how they form and what they look like. 
on the top left we have a gap which was formed when one lime tree a fairly small one actually lost its footing overbalanced um, knocked down another lime tree which knocked down yet another lime tree which knocked down an ash tree which then fell a, a large oak which you can hardly see it's the root plate in the distance which then fell another lime and so on down the slope the whole thing going one after the other is a kind of game of skittles bottom left this started at the top of a very steep slope in fact the top of the cliff really where the large a large oak overbalanced fell into a group of limes which were knocked down very easily and fell into a group of yew which all ended up sliding down the slope and coming to the most enormous pile of woody debris which has since um, slowly started to rot down bottom right we have another group of limes which have fallen over but only under the influence of a snowfall and just before Christmas two or three years ago we had a heavy wet snowfall and it brought down that lot as well as a lot of beech branches and things from crowns of trees damaged by squirrels I still find it amazing that squirrels can do that kind of damage and I find it even more amazing that um, snow will fell whole mature woodlands and create mayhem as you can see top right is um, impressed itself on me even more because I was actually in the wood when I heard a crack like a pistol shot and saw this ash falling which slumped to the ground with a whoosh leaving a shard which inescapably reminds me of New York and 9-11 now this was a calm day I wasn't expecting anything to fall at all um, but when I examined the tree I found that it had been rotting at the base for many many years and presumably had been damaged either by debarking or a stone rolling against it and damaging the bark whatever the reason was there was a long uh, interval between the actual damage and the result of that damage which is the tree to simply fall down so gaps form in various ways trees fall for various reasons they don't all fall at the point in time when the real cause of that fall um, the result of gap formation is that we have increasing amounts of dead wood at the bottom you see figures which are very roughly indicate that in those woods on in continental Europe which we sometimes describe as virgin forests um, values of something in the order of 100 cubic meters per hectare are found except where there's been a major disturbance where it goes very much higher in Lady Park Wood by the 1990s um, the red background figures um, the volumes had got up to roughly the same level it's for that reason I'd say it's become within the natural range of course the parts of the wood which is the neglected coppice um, which um, had were felled in the Second World War have not got anything like as far but they are building up um, and they will I suspect eventually get to the same levels as the older stands which are the lower figure of 47 to 129 now these are markedly larger than the um, values you get in managed wood the figures at the top with a bluish background and they're also much larger than you get even where the managers actually very deliberately try to build up the volume of dead wood by habitat piles and the like so in the century in which this wood has become more natural the deadwood volumes have built up from very small to natural woodland levels and so has the variety of dead wood you have uh, snags and tall trees dead branches in large trees um, as well as all the fallen wood on the ground and stumps of trees which have died
When gaps form, saplings which may already be present on the ground have an opportunity to grow. But gaps do not perform equally. Look at the two on the left hand side. These formed at roughly the same time, but one has filled with saplings and the other has filled with brambles, which prevent saplings from establishing and growing there. In fact, some gaps persist for a very long time simply because of brambles and bracken, which um, fill the gap indefinitely. Top right um, is a small patch of ground where lime, as well as maple and ash, are regenerating. One of the interesting observations is that all the trees and shrubs in Lady Park Wood seem capable of regeneration, but there is one exception, and that is the sessile oak. It's a major presence in the wood due to past management, um, but not one single oak has been recruited into the stand in the last three quarters of a century. The last one that tried was eaten by a deer last year. And it looks to me as if the oak is a tree which will only last as long as the existing individuals survive, which will be a long time. The bottom right shows vegetative regeneration, and that's important. Um, at least half the recruitment into Lady Park Wood in the last decade or more has been from vegetative sprouts rather than from seedlings. This one actually is a lime which has fallen over but kept in touch with its roots. It fell under ash trees which cast only a light shade and now it's regenerating vigorously from the top of the trunk to form a colonnade of saplings which will eventually become a colonnade of trees. It may even root if the trunk touches the ground. It's quite capable of rooting somewhere up in the canopy there and forming a new tree at some distance from the original tree entirely by vegetative means. You may be interested to know what has happened to the wildlife while this wood has become increasingly natural. And the answer is that there have been gains and losses. Let's look at the losses. The main group for which we have reasonably good information is the ground flora. Before 1979, 164 species had been recorded, but in recent years, we've only been able to find 112. Um, some of these, a few, 10, were new, but 62 of the previously listed species have not been found. And the main change, of course, has been that the species which grew in the open spaces in the past have been evicted from the wood. They haven't returned into the gaps which have formed. Uh, they still exist around the edges, as you can see from the top right photograph. But on the whole, um, this wood has been depleted of its entire gap phase flora. The shade species um, have also decreased. Um, our basic record is samples of eight metres squares, roughly a tabletop size. And in the 30 years between 1979 and 2009, the number found in that size of sample decreased by 50%. Essentially, the shade species have thinned out. A few, in fact, seem to have gone extinct within the wood. So it's been bad news for the vascular flora, and it's also been very bad news for the butterflies, which this was once a, a spectacular sight for woodland butterflies. But in recent years, I hardly ever see a, a single one. Here's one, the um, fungi, as you'd imagine, with so much more dead wood lying around and fungi growing out of the decaying timbers, um, the fungal flora looks pretty rich. And the, the Dean fungus group, when they visited and collected, came out with smiles on their faces and large collections. This is what we'd expect, but quite honestly, we don't know whether it's improved 
or increased as a result of the wood becoming natural because we have no old records or none to speak of. Um, it's possible the fungi were there in the managed woodland but were simply not fruiting. Nevertheless, that does illustrate what I think is the true case that as far as wildlife are concerned, there are gains and there are losses and there are possibly some groups which have not changed at all. I mean, the wood was found in the mid 1980s to be rich for um, mollusk, mollusca, um, slugs and snails, mainly in the limestone part, rich soil, um, were pretty rich. In fact, it's one of the richest in the La Wai Valley and I would mind betting those are still rich. I can't see why they should have changed yet. No one knows, no one's been back. This wood is very under-recorded as far as the fauna and flora is concerned. Now that gives you a small insight into Lady Park Wood and what we've been doing. And um, I want to wrap up by um, just emphasizing this question of change. I'm often asked by people who I show around visiting groups coming th around the wood. What do I think this wood will be like in the future? What kind of um, woodland would it um, become if we observed it indefinitely? And the answer is, I don't know. I mean, in 1944, when the study started, I think most ecologists would have had some concept of, of succession to a stable climate determined climax woodland which stayed there forever and a day. That's exactly not what uh, I read into the observations and results from three quarters of a century of observation. If this wood is blown flat in next week, which it could be, um, it will be probably a birch sycamore woodland in 30 years time. If it isn't blown flat and nothing much else happens in the next um, 30 years or so, it will continue to be a wood dominated by some combination of beech, lime, ash, oak, witch arm, and so on. The other point to make here is that um, through the three quarters of a century of observation, we've noticed that the tr current trends keep changing. The trajectory of succession is by no means stable before 1976, for example, it was very clearly heading towards beech dominance because beech was growing faster, its mortality rate was lower, and it was regenerating better. Everything pointed to beech being the tree of the future, almost to the exclusion of everything else. But events since then, such as the drought, which stopped the beech, the beech's recovery by 1985 to some extent, um, and then the advent of ash disease have perpetually changed the trajectory of succession. So even without a stand destroying disturbance, such as a great blowdown, um, the trajectory of succession is itself unpredictable. So that's my answer. I don't know, and neither do you and neither does anybody else. And I think that's the nature of natural woodland. It's unpredictable, unlike the managed woodlands, which foresters seek to make as predictable as possible. So I leave you with those thoughts. If you go there now, this is mid-November, a year or two back, <clears throat> you will find a wood which I can convince you is effectively natural, though it's not quite. I think it's very well worth studying, and I sincerely hope that this long-term set of observations can be continued in the future, though it won't be continued by me.